So I'd like to welcome to the Future Flocks podcast slash Zoom today, Pauline Leithen. She's an international artist and art gallery owner. Pauline, welcome to the show. Thank you. So Pauline, what was your childhood dream? I loved beautiful things like my grandmother's furniture and jewelry, and I loved flowers. And I just always wanted to be surrounded by beautiful things. That was sort of my childhood idea. Okay. And when did you first get the desire to paint? That was really thanks to my mother. My mother was very much giving us sketchbooks and coloring things and paint boxes and encouraged us to sit at a table and put a plastic on the table and we worked away. So my mother was very influential on that. Okay, that sounds, it always helps, doesn't it, when a mum is... Oh, yes, <laughs> yes. Okay, and when did you first become aware of colour and form? I think, actually, that, that little children become very early aware of colour and form. I was an art teacher, and for my uh, diploma, for my degree, uh, I studied, I did art with, with children from all ages, including kids from two years old. And I was really impressed that very young children already, like the cave paintings, they could make portraits and human figures for a while. And then that when they were older, that disappeared for a while. But very young children are already very aware of form and shapes and color. Yeah, they really are. And it's, it's wonderful how they translate that as well onto a page or a painting, even if it's in, you know, crayon or in- Yes. Paper. Yeah. So I've been lucky enough to know you a long time because I knew you as a child growing up in Greece. And as far back as I can remember, you were always having parties or some kind of creative art gathering and your sister was always playing music. And it was very encouraging. And that's something that translated later on, I think, into your art galleries, wherever you've been, whether it's been in Greece or New York. Did Greece inspire you as an artist? Yes, it absolutely did. I think wherever you are as an artist, that you always are inspired somewhere by where you are. And so Greece really inspired me with the openness and the wide open spaces. I came from a medieval city in Holland. So to be in these fields and these see the, 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 in the distance the sea. Uh, when I lived in Holland, I was making assemblages out of found materials. I lived in a neighborhood where there was a lot of dealers of second-hand dealers. I had a wood stove and these second-hand dealers gave me wood to burn. And I started making these sort of assemblages uh, that were like dolls I used for the faces, the cosmetic faces, these, you know, sort of empty faces. And then for the bodies I used, you know, chair legs with crossed legs and cans for breasts and little pieces that I found in the streets. But then when I went to Greece, I felt that not at all, it didn't fit at all in where I was. So I actually started painting very naturalistic uh, seascapes, you know, the horizon that I saw, the color of the sea, the color of the sky in the summer, in the winter, and the mountains around my house and the tiny little Byzantine churches. So yeah, my, my, my environment influenced me to, to make this very different work than what I was doing in Holland. Yeah, wonderful. And as we've actually said before, something that you once said to me about the way the wind skidded over the sea and that you could see that from the distance and the way rainwater came down a mountain and went all the way down the hill and into the sea, it stuck with me. And I put that in one of my books, Return to the Aegean. So you have oh, such an influence. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. Really nice. <laughs> you are the partner of Bix Lai, the son of Len Lai, the New Zealand artist known primarily for his er experimental film and kinetic sculpture. Has this idea that motion can be part of the language of art influenced you as an artist or a gallery owner? I was always interested uh, in, in what other people did. And actually, when I was in art school, we went to Amsterdam to a, an exhibition, a big exhibition. It was called 
moving movement. It was all about kinetic artists. And there I saw a sculpture by Len Lai. I had no idea that I would ever be partner with his son, but there was the <laughs> fountain in, Am in the Amsterdam Museum and uh, it, it impressed me. And there was also one other sculpture that I really, really liked. That was by Tenge Lee. It was the self-constructing and self-destroying painting machine. It was a machine that would throw paint on a canvas and then in the end it would just sort of all fall apart and it was an absolutely wonderful, wonderful piece of art. And I, yeah, at that, at that exhibition, I realized that machines and, and technical things could definitely be part of art, unlike medieval art and paintings and just sculptures that are solid. Um, in my paintings, uh, although I'm just their flat pieces, uh, but there is a lot of movement. I like movement, I like strokes, and I lived in Japan for also for a number of times. And so Japanese, you were saying, the environment did Greece influence me. In Japan, I also really learned a lot about, about Zen painting, about the force, the power of black ink and black strokes, and also about composition and the way Japanese have their own tradition of arranging their art and their works. And so I've learned a lot in Japan. Yeah, great use of space and color. I think Japanese culture is very powerful. So um, is that a painting of yours behind you? Yes, this is, uh, I work with found objects aside from my paintings. And this is actually car hood uh, because I lived in Williamsburg, which was in the beginning a very rough neighborhood. And it was known for its garbage and also all the stolen cars ended up there. And so you saw the stolen cars just standing in the streets and every day they were smaller, people took what they wanted. And at a certain point I thought, gee, these car hoods are really nice. Uh, they're sort of <laughs> a two dimension canvas. Yeah. And so I started taking the car hoods and I made a whole series of car hoods in Wilhelmsburg and also in Holland. I had an exhibition with 26 car hoods. The funniest thing is that, so I have a number of them in my house and sometimes people come there for the first time and they sit down for a while and then they look around and then suddenly say, oh, it's a car hood. They don't <laughs> realize in the beginning that it's a car hood and that's sort of nice. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's so original, it's amazing. So I was lucky enough to see the original Holland Tunnel Gallery in Brooklyn which came about because of a Williamsburg art tour weekend. When did the idea first come to you, Pauline, to exhibit art? And did you have any ambitions past that one weekend? Well, the main thing was when I first came to New York, I was very excited. I thought as an artist, I'll go to New York galleries and maybe I can get a show and this and that, maybe I can sell my work. So I went in a very positive way. I went to galleries and took a whole packet with my paintings with me and the galleries were very you know standoffish and they said no you can't do that you can't come here walk in with your paintings you have to have connections you, we have to know somebody else that brings you in and I, I did it a, I tried it a few times but every time the same the same result and I thought well I'm I'm not doing this anymore I'm already I'm a mother I'm an artist and to sell my own art, to bring it to galleries, that's the, the last thing I want to do. I'd rather just be a mother and an artist and make my work than getting these really negative responses. Yeah. So when I moved to Williamsburg, there was never a thought that I would have a gallery or something. But then when I moved to Williamsburg, there was this open studio tour in 97. And I had just built this tiny little pristine shed for my plant, my potted plants in the winter. It's a little eight by 10 Home Depot shed. But of course, because of the plants, we had to line it, insulate it, could bring electric in, put two little windows in. And it was really a beautiful little space. And I thought, gee, there's open studios. I'm gonna invite my friends and put myself in the gallery for a mini show. So yeah. we did it, about five or six artists. And it was really wonderful and people said, you should really keep it as a gallery. And I thought, yes, it's the only way to, to just be your own d director, have your own gallery. And so I, I kept the gallery and 
the next show, I had put some of the potted plants in because I just couldn't schlep them all the time in my house anymore. But the artworks and the plants were beautiful. That show was called Enchanted Forest. And I felt empowered to be able to make my own choices in, in what artist I showed. And sometimes I put myself in a group show. That's what wow. happened. So you were like the original girl boss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I love that. You were like, yes, doing it for yourself. Woo! Yeah. Just do it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's great. So did people support you in pursuit of your dreams? Aside from your friends, did you ever have to come across any kind of negativity as a kind of female boss? Did you ever come across any kind of male figures who said to you, oh, you know, that, that, you know, who weren't encouraging? No, people have always helped me, I think, because people feel that I really stand for what I want to do. And I've never had any feeling that, that men or males were in my way. I think I'm too tall and too Dutch for people to date <laughs> that. <laughs> right. Oh, okay. So you own galleries now in Newburgh, New York, and Paros, Greece. How did those galleries come into creation? Well, I had a little home tunnel in Williamsburg. And then on Paros, I bought in the town, you know, the town of Parikia very well. Uh, my sister, who is a jazz musician, a very good jazz musician and vocalist, we always had this dream to have somewhere a big old house where her partner could have a studio. I have a studio in the house where I live outside in the country and where she could have concerts and where we could show artworks and have readings and have, you know, poetry being spoken. And so in the end, we looked even at other islands and we looked in, in Marpisa, you know where that is. And in the end, we found it in the center of the main town of, of Paros right around the corner where my sister had, had a small house. We found this place right in the center, but in a little hidden corner. So we bought together in the beginning, in 2001 or two or something, we bought together this big old house. It was really the house of, especially my dreams. And we fixed it all over. It was very neglected. Wow. And so we had, had it rented, you know, my sister lived there for a while. It was too big for her, but it's now an American, American art school. And then downstairs in these old storage spaces with arches, with marble pieces, we made the gallery. And it's only open in the summer uh, for six weeks about. And in the beginning, I did it also the Greek theme like Metamorphosis, uh, Olympus, Revi Olympus Revisited, um, just Greek themes that, that were nice. For, and I invited international artists to play with that theme. And my sister was upstairs in the summers, in the winter, we tried to rent it. But in the end, there's now an American art school in the winter in the whole building. And in the summer, I have the gallery and the upstairs for, for exhibitions and for other things. But isn't that incredible? You started with, you know, the, the Home Depot shed, and then you're now hosting an, an art school, which is just, you know, it's amazing. I mean, at what point, did you feel that the buzz about your art galleries made you just feel validated? What, what, at what point did you just go, wow, this is really happening? Yeah, I felt it. I mean, that's hard to say. Sometimes I would just think, gee, it's really amazing. This gallery, it came just from this little gallery oh. and it came from nothing really. And so, yeah, so the Williamsburg, the little gallery, the eight by 10 doesn't exist anymore because Williamsburg first, first, the first pioneers, because it was a rough neighborhood where of course artists went there. And there was a lot of galleries with, with, with artists becoming their own directors. They had in their living rooms and their studios, galleries. So at a certain point, 36 galleries in Williamsburg. But now it's a totally different place. There's huge buildings have gone up and it's, it's all young people who zoom to the bars. They, nobody's interested in art. It's all restaurants, bars, and you know places like that. And so that's why I left. They built a huge building right behind the gallery, 19 stories. So my view from the Empire State Building and the Willisburg Bridge is all gone. So I came through friends. I heard about Newburgh. 
Newburgh is an old town at the Hudson. And when I step out of my door, I can see the Hudson. And it's an, yeah, it was a very neglected town. A lot of beautiful old houses were just falling apart. But again, um, it, it was a rough place. There was 50% unemployment. There was a lot of drug dealing, mafia. But slowly now it's, it's reinventing itself. It used to be called the, the jewel of the Hudson because a lot of very rich people built beautiful houses. Then it went way down and it became sort of a crime area, crime city, dangerous. And now it's coming up again. And so anyway, I fell in love when I first came here and bought immediately a house because I thought I have to get away from Williamsburg and what's happening there. Mm. And then I was able to buy this in the industrial building around the corner where the gallery is now. It's a beautiful, it's a real gallery. It's big and high, tall. And uh, it's artist studios. And I have really a lot of help now because it's, it's become a little more um, involved with the, you know, things on the website and all kinds of stuff, which I can't do. I'm very untechnical, but I have wonderful people who help me and who take care that the gallery is, is there, you know, that it gets out. And so we have wonderful exhibitions there now and musical performances. My sister has played there several times. And of course, COVID was not a help, but we're just slowly opening up again. Yeah, I mean, I think honestly that you, you, you kind of play down the beauty of both the buildings because your house in part, your, um, your gallery on Paros is a beautiful old merchant house with those beautiful white walls, which are perfect for displaying paintings. And your gallery in Newburgh has these gorgeous wooden floors. Um, and I would love it if you could give us, I don't know if you can give us a quick tour with the iPad at the end of the interview. Uh, the trouble is that I'm not in the gallery right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> and the, 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 the Sunday afternoon that we were supposed to have it, yeah. that, was the, that was the last day of the exhibition oh. when artists talk and the artists took all their works home, oh. unfortunately. Ah, technicality. But no, but, but Emma, it's online because as I said, I have now people who help with the gallery and yeah. this woman, the new uh, assistant Tamara, she mm -hmm. did a walkthrough. So you should be able to see it online. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll put a link on, on the podcast. And yeah, on YouTube yeah. To the because she went all around. I was there and she went all around. She, she did the people who were talking, but then also the art. Yeah, so find it online. That's a very good idea. Perfect. Okay, so we're, this um, podcast slash Zoom is about dreams. So Pauline, what's the best thing that has happened to you in your pursuit of dreams? Well, I think the most important thing is my kids and my grandchildren. That's <laughs> the most important. Also, when I was little, you know, playing with dolls and stuff, I always thought, oh, I want to have babies and I want to be a mother. So that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And as far as dreams, other dreams, um, I, I also love the places that I live. They are also, I always wanted to be in them very nice old house i love old things uh, my dream about my art is that i haven't in the last few years i haven't been making enough art i always worked a lot in greece because i have a wonderful studio there and i haven't been like two years it's two years ago that i was there then the year before we didn't go and then this year we were there but there were some circumstances it was for one thing it was the hottest summer in 43 years it was very crowded in town because I think a lot of people had been locked up and everybody, Greece was number one destination in Europe, I think. And so my dream about being able to do more art undisturbed, that hasn't come quite about. But in Holland, we always say you put it on a low flame and it will, it will happen. So that's, I'm not worried about it. I'm just patient. It's brewing. <laughs> it's <laughs> yes. Yeah, and I like that. I like that because amazing things happen when you, as an artist, you just, you don't kind of push it or force it. You know, you just let it brew yeah. and you just... Yeah, you and you always it. absorb things forever. As an artist, I think you always, even if you're not creating, you're still noticing, you're still absorbing 
things that are in your system somewhere. And then when the time is there, you'll use them somehow. You, you, you have all that, that, that material. Yeah, absolutely. It's very exciting too. So Pauline, how do you decide which artists to exhibit? There has to be some sort of connection uh, with the work. I mean, sometimes there's work that I that's totally new to me. I mean, it's not that I it would it would be possible that I only like work that is connected with my work, but there is so much other work that's really interesting. And I also like to put artists together. We had a couple of one-man shows, but we decided it's better to have a like a three-man show because these artists bring a connection, the, the, the work has to have a certain connection in it. The, and we ask, so often ask when one artist comes whose work we like, we say, would you like, do you have some people that you would like to show with? And it's really interesting what, what sort of combinations you get. Right. So it, the work is very different. Uh, we just see something and then we, we talk about it. So I can't really say, it's just most, you know, when I look at art, I know pretty well, like, yeah, I really like this. This is totally surprising and this is wonderful. Yeah. And sometimes I have also something that I think, well, this is, no, I don't, I don't like, like really violent work or extremely political work. For me, it's, I like beautiful things. I said that in the beginning and I don't want shocking work because that's not for me. Yeah, yeah. We, we could go off a tangent on another discussion there so easily with you, but <laughs> I better stick to the questions of the podcast. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so do you have artists in residence or do you have seasonal themes or it's just something that appeals to you personally or that has been recommended to you? Yeah, I always encourage artists when I meet them or when other people say we know somebody, I said, let them send some let them send some material and then we look at it and then we can do the next step, meet and look at the work in, in reality. Um, yeah, so that's sort of how we go about, yeah. Fantastic. So as long as I've known you, you've always been an encourager, a supporter of other artists and creatives. So why do that, Pauline? Why not just promote your own work? Well, I get enthusiastic about other people's work. And yeah, so I, I made a book about the Holland Tunnel, the little Holland Tunnel. And when you come here sometime, I'll give it to you. Okay. Uh, and so there, were, there was an, I wrote an article about the gallery and how it came about. And in the end, somebody asked, what's the mission of your gallery? And I said, the mission of my gallery, aside from showing artists, give them a chance to show, even in a small gallery, I want to encourage the people who come to the gallery to buy something because sometimes people come to the gallery and they look at the work and I can see they like it and then they don't dare to buy it because they've never bought something and they think well what, what the other what the, our friends think that we bought this and maybe they don't like it. it's it's for people who've never bought an artwork it's sort of a a big step to buy something and I always encourage people to buy something I said you'll you come home and you see this work that you bought. That's the first thing. And the next thing is, once you have bought one piece, then you look more intense to other pieces of art. And then suddenly you see, just like we make a combination of artists, uh, you can make, it's the start of an art collection. And that's really, that's very nice. That's very exciting. So you keep looking at art, you go to more galleries and you make a collection and that's very exciting. And the next question was, uh, do you sell a lot in your gallery? And then my answer was, I'm my own best client. <laughs> because of course I do show people with work I like and I very often end up buying something. So that's, that's those two questions. <laughs> Great, I mean, that's the problem, isn't it? When you start buying art, that's it. But it is scary taking that first leap. Yes. By yeah. a painting. Um, because you think, whoa, what am I doing? But I think art is always an investment. I really do. So fabulous. I love that, that you're buying, buying stuff. <laughs> yes, I And it's, it makes me happy to look at other people's work. I have them all around my house. Other people, I've saw my own pieces, but I have other people's work. And I'm 
it makes me very happy. Yeah, that's gorgeous. So aside from being a mum, because I know you would say that that is your greatest accomplishment, what has been your greatest achievement in life? Or maybe achievements <laughs> since, you are, <laughs> since you are a woman boss. <laughs> well, I think the yeah a, a great achievement was that I came really with hardly anything to New York with two sons, and that I worked as a house painter, cleaning lady first as a house painter, wow. and that I that I, with a small inheritance from my father, I bought my own house. So I was, again, my own boss. And that I really have been able to, somehow by working very hard as a house painter, have been able to, to make sort of a, um, investments in other buildings. And so now I live here. This is a beautiful house. And uh, I'm, but I have some houses in Williamsburg and that I'm, I'm selling some because like my youngest son and his Korean wife are going to have like twins next month, a boy and a girl. Wow. And they, are, they, they don't have a lot of money that I can help them. Uh, that what, all the work that I've done as a house painter and doing this and, and making the right choices of buying an, an old house in the right area. I think it's sort of, it's sort of amazing that I, have done that because as a child, I was very, very shy, very withdrawn and, and, you know, very, maybe because I was born in the war, you know, I had not an easy start. And so that as this really shy sort of moody child <laughs> that, I, that I just did this, you know, that I have this gallery and that I can, that I can be with other, I can make a nice meal here for other people and be together with people. and. The, the gallery is really nice. Like Sunday, this closing of the, the bit of artist talk, the artists were so nice and they thanked me. And I thought, this is so nice that we can do together all these things. We do together all these things that are really positive and it makes me happy. Yeah, beautiful. So you're a community innovator. Well, In a, I think so. Yeah, in some, well, I wouldn't call it that, but. I have created an area um, like this, where the gallery is now. I have some pieces of land next to it that I was able to get those so that they wouldn't rebuild and I would lose all my, the side of my windows. And there was a building, there was like a lot of bricks that came down from that building and they're all lying in my, in my field, sort of next to the gallery. And now what my dream is, is to make a small amphitheater there so that with the background of this, this, the inside of the house, the rest is fallen down. That's where the bricks came from. But you wow. still see where the open fireplaces were. You see where there's some wall moldings and everything, but it's just one wall. So it's like that background and then make this amphitheater that goes where the basement was from the house and have sort of the stairs because being, you know, in Greece or so an amphitheater is very good for sound. And then That's with this perfect. background, and that's my dream, to make this amphitheater and have performances and films and music right next to the gallery. I will come, I'll be in it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'll be in the show for sure, yes please. So that's fantastic news about the amphitheater and also for your son Roy, please pass on my congratulations to him and his wife. Yeah, yeah, very exciting. Very exciting, my goodness. Um, so you said that you were a little bit shy. Um, and a, a kind of question occurred to me as we were speaking, what encouragement would you give to children who have the urge to paint and the urge to create, but they, they're not sort of brave enough or they maybe think to themselves, oh, I'm not a painter or I, I can't do that. What would, you, what would you suggest to them as a way to begin? Well, the thing is, I was an art teacher for a number of years. And a lot of kids are frightened because they think they have to make, make it perfect. And the thing is, there is no perfect. I always say whatever you do is, is good. It's you. Yeah. And everybody does something different. It doesn't matter. And sometimes kids, smaller kids came to me and said, oh, can you help me draw the face or something? I said, no, you, you make the face 
however way you do it, because it's you, it will come out of you and that's the way it is. So I always encouraged the kids to just be themselves, to not be scared. I said, you just do it. And actually I still have from the time I was a teacher, because a lot of kids were very frightened of faces, especially to make a face. And I let the kids sit across from each other and they made these portraits of each other. And I asked if I could have some of those portraits and I have a whole collection of children's drawings, which I'll show in the gallery sometime because they're from 1968 or something. That's when, yeah, 1967. It was very cheap paper, unfortunately, because that's what they got in the school. But I have a whole collection of children's drawings and including those are those portraits and they're absolutely wonderful. They are so wonderful. I said, you just make each other's portraits. And they did, and it was, I made all these little exhibitions in the hallway of the school to see each subject, you know, to have a little exhibition and, and the kids liked it, the teachers liked it. But I'm going to make an exhibition of all these really old 1967 drawings in the gallery. And I want to combine it to, to connect with schools here if the kids can also make drums and to have like then and now. That's gorgeous. I'm sorry, I was like caught up with your enthusiasm there. It made me want to giggle. <laughs> <laughs> it was so lovely. That's so gorgeous that you kept those. So yeah. would, you, would you encourage others to pursue their dreams or pursue their ambitions? What, what words of caution or advice would you give to others? Well, I think, first of all, don't go overboard, <laughs> you know, keep it within <laughs> reality. Yeah. But I say just go for it, go for it. And, and if you really want to do this, don't give up, you know, find ways, creative ways to, to, make, to make it happen. Yeah, absolutely fabulous. Is there anything that you would like to add to any viewers about your art, or about your um, beautiful galleries? No, I don't think so. I, I love my galleries. I love the contact and the, you know, the working together with artists and with all these people. And my own, as I said, my own work, I feel that I've gotten a little bit distant from it. And that's what I, it's now, you know, we're close to December and that's a, always a good month to think, well, next year, I'm going to do it different. It's a new start. That's always important. So, okay, I'm going to do my own work more now and yes. step a bit from other things. So that's all I have to say, really. Okay, so what date, Pauline, will your exhibition be next year? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have, because next year, it's 25 years ago that we started the Holland Tunnel. <gasps> oh, okay. Yeah. But yes, you, have so it's, to have, you have to have your stuff in there. You have to have well, stuff. No, what I'm going to do is I think in in November, because we I opened the gallery in November 97. So I'm going to have an exhibition. For now, I call it 25, because then my sister and the people I talk to, they know what I, which exhibition I'm talking about. And that's with six artists that were from the very beginning in the Holland Tunnel. And that's of course Bix, and then my sister Helene will come. But she's a very she's a musician, so she'll come over and and you know have concerts for that exhibition. And it's so it's Bix and Jan, her partner, is a painter, and some other people that were from the beginning in the Holland Tunnel. It's, it's six artists, and that will be a very nice and big exhibition. I'm excited about that. Okay, is that going to be in New York or Paris or both? It's going to be, yeah, it's, it's in Newburgh. No, mm -hmm. not in, because in Paris, I only do summer exhibitions. And actually I have already planned next year's exhibition. Uh, this time it's an artist from Paros. Uh, he's not alive anymore, but there was an, a shoemaker. And he always, when he didn't fix shoes, he made little paintings. And they are beautiful about Paros life, like fishing boats, fishes, cattle, farmers, churches. They're really wonderful, wonderful. And he, since he was a shoemaker, he, he worked on cardboard and he made a tiny little loop at the top so he could hang it. And some of them are a little bit lopsided, but his wife always asked if I wanted to buy some of his paintings because they needed the money. And I bought a lot of his work. And so next year 
I'm planning to show all that work. And I'm also planning to make a series of postcards that people can buy, uh, 12 postcards with his work and a calendar for, I think for 2023, because I want the, the collection of these paintings, I really want to keep together. And if the, the town of Paros gives me a space, it should be a permanent uh, exhibition because this guy, everybody knew him. He died when he was 85 or something. And I think for tours, it would be very nice to see all these local images uh, done by a Greek from Paros. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be really nice for Paros and they could make some money by selling these things, which to pay for the, for the space, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> What a wonderful idea. Um, as usual, you are just so creative. It's amazing and so organized. Note to yourself. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so um, Pauline, thank you so very much for uh, the Zoom interview. And for any viewers, you can catch Pauline's galleries online and the link will be included in the Zoom and the podcast. So Pauline, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emma. I'm very proud of you that you're doing all this and it's wonderful that we've known each other for such a long time. Yes. All, and I hope to 